Oh, I'm not doing that. I think Chris, yeah, there you oh, go. Start the recording, Chris. Chris Mayer, our, our uh, Sergeant at Arms, our HBRC host. We are now recording. All right. Like to every, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, February meeting, general meeting of the uh, Homebrew Robotics Club. We have a very special presentation this evening by Dr. Thuk Vu, the founder and CEO of Omni Labs. Their flagship product, the Omni Robot, is an award-winning telepresence robot that transforms how people connect from their homes, businesses, classrooms, and hospitals. Now, the order of events for this evening's meeting will be uh, first, robot news. Uh, then we'll have club news. What I need help with. Then we'll have our infamous show and tell session. And then we'll have our special presentation by Dr. Thuk Vu. And finally, random access where we hang out in the parking lot until security comes and kicks us out. So uh, let's go ahead and get started here with robot news. I'd like to, to start out with uh, probably what is the uh, biggest uh, news of the, um, of the week? Uh, let me get over here and share my screen. Screen share, share. And uh, does everybody see the uh, Mars Rover Perseverance there, the Perseverance Rover? Yeah. Yep. Folks watch that, wasn't that cool? That was amazing. Yeah, I can't imagine spending 10 years on something like this and it, it's legitimately um, seven minutes of terror. <laughs> Those people, they could finally breathe again when the thing landed, right? <laughs> did, did you see the uh, simulator that they have? Like the, uh, it shows the full trajectory and it runs in your browser, um, a live rendering of that. Uh, you got something you can post in the chat there? Uh, I'm, I'm not, I don't have access to that right now, but uh, yeah, I might do it later. I'm trying to get back to the screen where I could post in the chat. Let's see here. So somebody pointed out that this was not a robot landing on Mars. This was at least four robots landing on Mars. Oh, yes. So the it, path has, it has a helicopter. Yeah, the Pathfinder. You have the helicopter. You have the back shell, which deployed the parachute, which also did a lot of autonomous actions. And then you have um, the uh, sky crane that lowered the robot down that also had some autonomous fat functions to it. They all had cameras on them. So it really was at least four robots or four autonomous systems that work perfectly. It's pretty, pretty impressive. Exciting. I posted uh, in the chat there a link to NASA's uh, uh, the, Mar the uh, Perseverance. Also, uh, I don't see it in the chat. Are you sure you posted it? I don't see it. You see it in the chat? Nope. Look again. Anybody see it? There's NASA Gov. I'm not seeing it either. Well, uh, oh, I just, well, did I post it to an individual or did they post it there? Uh, but let me try uh, posting it to everyone. How about that? Did you post it to the Pentagon camp? No, I, po I posted again. it to, to John Carlini. There we go. Okay. Now can everybody see it? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, also, um, there was some news about the uh, a rover that's going to land on the south pole of the moon in 2023, the Viper mission. And um, uh, I understand that they're going to use a little ROS too in there, so that's kind of exciting. You know why? You know why um, they use uh, Linux uh, for the space missions? Because you can't open windows in space. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Uh, robot news. What else we got for robot news out there? Somebody. Uh, well, um, I could present the survey results. That's club news, dude. Oh. You're getting ahead of us. Anybody have any just plain robot news out there? Well, obviously, Fry you know, yeah. finally admitted that they were gone. So uh, many of us will, they will be missed. 
Yeah, um, good times. You're officially gone? Or like, uh, that... I believe the stores are now officially closed. They're basically they, real they, estate they, holding now. They aggregated it down to the last cell phone, I believe, the last store with the last cell phone. It's like they kept shrinking and shrinking. Anyways, that, that good times, Fry's Electronics, good times. Yeah, they decided to stop buying inventory like like two or three years ago. I mean, they haven't updated anything in the stores in a long time. Yeah, yeah I know. Even like five years ago, they stopped restocking the resistors and stuff. And I'm like, what's the deal? But you couldn't get them to admit it. They wouldn't admit it. The score, they, stores got no. emptier, and they wouldn't say a word until they pulled the plug. I've actually, Campbell store. I actually never. Uh, I just recently went like. Uh, last last year to Fry's for the first time. Um, so my first experience is when they're shutting down. So it was like really eerie um, versus like the pictures I've seen in the past where like Fry's all full of stuff. Cool. Yeah, very, especially during the pandemic where everything's kind of shut down and uh, yeah, so good times. <laughs> Any more robot news out there? General robot news before we move on to club news. All right, let's get into club news now. Um, Chris, you want to tell us about the survey? Sure, I would love to. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let's see, screen two, share. So is everybody seeing the, the nice colored bar charts? Yes. OK, great. So I'll quickly go through this. Um, we had a total of 48 responses. So I wanted to personally thank everybody who took the time. Can I make it bigger? Sorry. Uh, let's see. Is that helping? Yes. Okay, let me let me go one more control plus. There we go. Um, so I wanted to thank uh, everyone who took the time to respond. We definitely appreciate your feedback because that's what helps keep this uh, club current and meeting the needs of you guys. So the first question is basically about robot building, just to get an idea of who's building robots and who wants to build robots. Um, and uh, 28 people responded that, yeah, they would, uh, they want to build a robot. Now, some of those said that they wanted to join a group because it is sometimes a lot more fun to work on a group on a project. Um, and other people said that they want to work on more complicated robots. They may have already done the challenge robots and they're looking for something a little bit more of a, more of a challenge and the challenge is uh, so for those people who said that, please contact me by email because there are lots of projects that are in the works and some of uh, the ones that I'm leading and I can get you hooked up with some projects and get the right fit for you. Um, some other people said that they would look like to get some help with building their first robot or getting some challenge robots done um, for those people. Again, please contact me and I'll be happy to get you started, get you uh, some pointers to materials and some projects um, and groups to get you started building your robots. Um, Chris, Chris, how would people get in touch with you? Uh, my email address uh, or yeah, my email address cmayor777 at gmail.com. I cannot put that in the chat right now while I'm sharing my screen but I will put that in when I'm done presenting the rest of these slides. Um, some people also said here that they were interested in earning their certificates. Now we started this certificate program a couple of years ago for people who completed the challenges. So it's good that there's some interest in those that project or program kind of died off, uh, especially when we started moving to zoom. Um, so I guess the good news, we, we, we will make sure that we get certificates out for those people who do the challenge, which is, um, 
So let's move on to the second one. Um, this is the challenges themselves, uh, just to get an idea of how many people are interested in the various challenges. It looks like the floor bot is going to be the popular one this year. Uh, but keep in mind, the challenges start next meeting. So you have a month to get something uh, ready. To March show. is challenge month. Exactly. So that get going. You've got a month month left to get your first challenge robot done. Phase one. This will be our 19th annual. Wow, 19 years. Okay, question three was about uh, group involvement. And you can see people using the news group, that's the biggest draw, um, which I would agree with. That's where we share information uh, and get help mostly. Um, it's good to see people are attending the Zoom meetings here. I, I know it's difficult. Um, and the SIGs, so those are the top three things. Uh, the bottom three things, I want to address the people who clicked that, people who want to lead a class or a project, or people who want to uh, give one of the one-hour presentations during one of the meetings, and people who would just in general like to volunteer. Um, we really appreciate that help. Please contact me again if you're uh, interested in any of those things. If you're interested in giving the one-hour lecture, uh, please contact Joseph Hetty. That's programs at hbrobotics.org. He's in charge of scheduling our one-hour speakers. Um, and then the other people, if you're interested in leading a class or project or would like to volunteer, we do have some things that we need some help with. So thank you very much for your volunteer efforts. Moving on, question four, what do you like or dislike about Zoom? Um, yeah, IRL was better. Uh, in general, the positive is that we're now open to a wider audience. Um, on the negative side, we you know, apologize for the hour, but we are a West Coast group. So all you people in Florida and Barbados <laughs> and Europe, sorry about that. Um, also, yeah, random access is not working as well on Zoom. Um, I'm not sure what we can do about that. So we're definitely open to ideas. Uh, so please speak up if you have any ideas to make the random access and uh, a little bit better. Um, the, the other thing was some people mentioned that it was it's difficult for people to do their demos during show and tell. And that I can understand because you're trying to show off your robot and you've got a mobile camera or maybe your cell phone and you're trying to show your robot off. Um, so we're looking for ideas on how we can show the members how to do a better five minute presentation of the robot. Um, some ideas, maybe do a video rather than live because we all know the live demos don't always go to plan. Um, and maybe one of the people that wanted to volunteer for question three could potentially make a how to do an effective demo on Zoom demo. Um, and that can be an example for people during show and tell. So we can see robots better and get a just better communication across. Um, and that's mo most of that input. So let's move on to question five. What types of presentations are people interested in? Um, the, the big one was ML AI. Everybody or most people are interested in ML AI. Um, high on the list is Ross talking about Ross. I think we had one. I'm already. getting a big ad over the uh, answers, so I'm not seeing the uh, graph at all. Uh, I thank think you. Responses. Oh, thank you. I, I didn't notice that. Um, uh, let's see, a, a couple people said, hey, can we get Boston Dynamics to come and give a presentation? That would be cool. Um, I'll post all the details. I don't want to go over all them now, but I'll post details of this in the news group, in the mailing list. Uh, but a lot of good, interesting feedback on what type of pop topics people want to hear. So the next was about our online areas. And two things we noted from this is 
a lot of the things we have, people weren't aware of it. And even the people who were aware of it, they didn't get used very much. Um, you can see the top one is the, the news group, the blue bar here, which makes sense. Um, and then followed by that is the website. I suspect that most people go to the website only so that they can click the link to get to the news group and to see when the next meeting is to click the Zoom meetings. Um, and it's good that we've got some good participation of people in the news group. That's the main thing that HBRC does to get people together building robots. Um, the rest of the stuff, uh, I would like people to pipe up uh, either in the chat in this meeting today or via email to any of the officers if there's any other part of HBRC's presence on the web that you would be sad to have disappear, let us know because it's possible that these other areas might end up on the chopping block if they're not popular and it's gonna take effort to maintain. So other than the three biggies, if you're using, uh, well, of course the YouTube channel. So, but things like the, the GitHub page, um, the LinkedIn page, the, the newly created Facebook page. If that's not something you're really interested in, great. But if it's something you really like, let us know. So we will decide to keep it. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is general. What do you like or dislike about the onlines? Um, the two biggest issues, other than not being aware that they exist, the, the minor sections is news group moderation. Uh, people are perceiving that to be a bit slow. So uh, we will get together the officers and decide if we want to maybe open it up to less moderation or be more liberal in uh, taking the moderation flag off of people who post on a regular basis. Um, so those are two ideas. And the other one is the website needs a makeover. Um, we're actually in agreement and we're doing things, uh, for example, the new members page. So hopefully we'll be seeing some makeover of the main website this year. So moving on to question eight, group charter. Um, keep it home brew. That's what everybody wants to do. Uh, a few people are interested in robotics jobs and more corporate related information. Um, we'll take that up as an advisement. Um, I personally like jobs info because a lot of people are, that's just an interest. Uh, so we may open that up a bit. We'll talk about that uh, and see if we make any changes as a result. Um, the last question, interesting, uh, should the group crowdfund a reference robot, or maybe not even crowdfund it, but create some reference robots and have how-tos so that people can easily go and make their first floor bot or table bot. Um, if you're interested in doing something like this, there's actually projects uh, that I've recently started with the potential for crowdfunding. Um, so please contact me if you're interested in doing something like that. Uh, we may or may not have it under the HBRC umbrella. It may be just a group of HBRC members going off and doing something. Not sure how that will gel, but contact me if you're interested and let's get something started. Uh, let's see, memberships. Um, so most of you are members or were a member in the past. Um, the yellow and the cyan are people that have already joined this year or plan on joining this year. Really quickly, here's our homepage. And if you click membership and dues right here, if you can see that, that's the last tab. This will show you how to sign up. It's cheap. It's only $10 per household. Um, and it benefits the club. So thank you to everybody who's a card carrying member. Um, Dan, are we planning on sending out cards or is that gonna be on an as requested basis? Right, so um, thanks for covering the membership part. I was gonna talk about that, but you covered it so well. 
Um, it, the cards are on an as requested basis. Um, not too many people have requested them so far. Uh, when we go back to getting to being live in real life together, I can't wait for that day. Uh, at that point, the cards will be very useful uh, and we'll hand them out at that time. Unless you request it to be mailed out to you, we can do that as well. Uh, I just want to reemphasize that there's a few benefits uh, to being a member, but you don't have to be a member. You can come to the Zoom call every month. You can participate in the news groups. You don't have to be a member to do any of those things. Uh, but there are some benefits. And the biggest benefit is supporting the club and you know, keeping our membership strong, keeping our, our momentum going. So when we come out of COVID, we still have a strong membership base. So I encourage you to sign up if you haven't done already. If you have, uh, thank you so much for signing up. It takes about a minute to sign up and 10 bucks over PayPal. Um, so if you feel moved to sign up and become a member, uh, the club is stronger for it and we appreciate it. Uh, if you wanna get the card in your hand, let me know and we can send it out to you. The instructions, as Chris said, the instructions are right there on the webpage. All right, thank you, Dan. And I apologize for stealing your thunder, but- uh, No, you did second. it really well. Cause you had hey, this job Dan, before I did. They should send yeah, that email to secretary at hbrobotics.org. Or treasure, yeah, or treasure. Or you can just put it in, when you sign up, there's a place for comments. So you can put it there as well. Ah, okay, secretary or treasurer. But you know, it's, it's easiest when you sign up on PayPal and it says, do you have any comments? Most people have been saying 2021 dues. So if you say, send me the card, um, that's, it's just easy. You can do that. Okay. And just briefly, this is a bit of a tangent. There is another tab on the main webpage uh, that says officers right here, the third one. Uh, so if you need to contact me or anybody else, all of our email addresses for Camp, Dan, Joseph, myself, Camp, and Mark are right here. So... Hey, All Chris. That you can contact us with are here. I see mine be, is missing. That will be quickly re remedied. This this might be a good <laughs> yes. This that this might be a good opportunity to uh, talk about the uh, the new members, the new upcoming members page. Now I don't see Al Margolis out there. Al, are you out there? So we've already started on it. Why don't you click on members there and let's see what happens. There we go. Live demo. This is another benefit of membership. You must be a um, member in good standing. Uh, but uh, and this, this we're going to roll this out uh, with the um, uh, challenge uh, in March. March is our challenge month, phase one. Um, and, and we're still in club news here. Um, this will be our 19th annual uh, HBRC challenge phase one. Um, without, <laughs> um, I'll be bugging you ag, ag nauseum all month long to be building robots because next uh, month uh, you are responsible for the presentation. Uh, and so it's nothing but a big uh, show and tell event. And so everybody should be building for this event. We're a builder's club. Our stock and trade is functioning robots, but works in progress are good for partial credit. Uh, so, so we're gonna build up this members page and there you'll have a picture of you and your robot and uh, we can get to know each other better that way. And, 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 and we'll actually, this, the, the, the first uh, full instance of it uh, is geared towards uh, April 3rd, which is National Robotics Week. Uh, so again, uh, our, um, our meetings, our general meeting is the last Wednesday of the month. Uh, and uh, this uh, upcoming month in March uh, is our uh, challenge meeting. Uh, and the whole meeting is gonna be nothing but show and tell. So you've got four weeks uh, to get your robot. You are working on a robot, right? Right, uh, get it off the shelf. Uh, dust it off, charge it up, fix it, uh, make it better, do whatever you do. We're a builder's club and uh, you are responsible for a uh, presentation next month. So I'll be bugging y'all month long. I'll keep the header uh, 19th annual HBRC challenge phase one. So, you know, if you're not interested in hearing me go on and on, you can just 
uh, ignore that email, but I'm mostly talking to myself on those emails anyways, but I'll be bugging you all month long to get your robot running. So be prepared. And, and again, uh, we want to use this to, and, and, and Al will be uh, announcing it uh, in the mailing, in the uh, mailing list uh, to uh, submit to him uh, images, image of yourself, uh, a short synopsis, a longer, a longer story, uh, and some photos, uh, so that you can be on our, mem our official members page. Okay. All right, moving along. Uh, we're still in uh, club news here. So hey, well, there's just one more thing because there were, because the free version of survey monkey only allows us 10 questions. So the last question was just generic miscellaneous. Um, and some of the suggestions are really good. Um, some of the top ones I'll mention right here is more how to's people are asking for how to build a robot. Um, if, and there's one that I did for the Motbot, which is a great first robot. Uh, I know Danny had a class for building something very similar. So, um, I think as a result, maybe we can put something on the main webpage to point to some how-to YouTube videos uh, to get people up and running. Uh, the other thing that was mentioned, again, mentioned here was sort of slow news group moderation. So we will look at that and see what we can do to speed that up or to remove that restriction if possible for most of the members. One of the benefits of being a paid member is we can make you unmoderated. So there's a reason for the 10 bucks. Um, the other things involve more challenges, uh, specifically a ROS-based challenge, because most of our challenges are hardware-based. Uh, but that was interesting suggestion, do some software-based challenges, and specifically some things to like Hello World ROS-type challenges, and in general, just more challenges. I think people have who have already done the easy ones are looking for something more challenging. So uh, we'll try to put together some new ones. I think the latest one we added was the arm challenge, which was an articulated arm. And so we've sent out some certificates for that. And, and last was just another mention for jobs postings. Uh, that's something that people are really interested in. Um, so we have typically taken the stance we're a homebrew club where we don't want to be commercial. Um, however, if this is what our members want, then we will discuss it amongst ourselves and see if we can do something about that. And that was our survey. So thank you very much. All right. We're still on club news. I have a few other items. Um, we're running a Ross discussion group on Tuesday evenings, and you'll see that in the forum. I just I'm in the mailing list. I post a link to that. And of course, our SIG meeting, special interest group meeting, is pretty much an all show and tell random access meeting. That's on the penultimate Wednesdays. Of course, this general meeting is the last Wednesday every month, except December. Uh, and we've already mentioned that Mar March is our challenge month. So let's get building. We have uh, uh, next month's meeting is all show and tell. And uh, we've talked about our members page a bit. And uh, you'll hear from Al Margalis on that uh, in, the, in the mailing list. Uh, we want to get folks on, on the uh, in our members page. Is there any other club news out there? Camp, I, I was just wondering, um, the challenge months are month three, six, and nine. Is that right? Uh, yes, it'll be March, June, and September. It's quarterly. Okay. So those are our challenge months, uh, phase one, two, and three. There's a story behind that, but we won't go through that right now. Uh, but uh, just leave it that uh, our first challenge meeting is in March, and uh, the whole meeting show and tell. So you have a presentation uh, to give next month. Any more club news? Okay, the next uh, session is uh, what I need help with. And uh, what I need help with uh, this month, um, I'd like to give credit to somebody. Chaz 
with our Ross 2 meetup that meets on Sundays. Incidentally, I'll put a link to that in the chat. That's a, that's a um, strictly Ross 2 meeting uh, that is um, uh, run by Chaz. Uh, he's in, uh, he's in, he's, I believe he's in uh, around the Dallas, Texas here. Oh, Houston. He's in Houston, Texas. Uh, but that, that one's strictly Ross too. Regardless, uh, let me, he, he, he helped me with something that you guys are probably, you guys are more aware of this than I am. Let me uh, share my screen just so that it makes sense. Uh, the, again, what we're, where we are is, um, um, what I need help with. And what I needed help with, I was trying to compile uh, the navigation to package for Ross to it, it wouldn't compile. And I thought that when you went here and said Foxy Dell, Devel, for example, and you went and you got your um, get your get clone, I thought that that would give me the Foxy Devel clone, but turns out it doesn't. You have to specify uh, the branch Foxy Devel. I'll paste this in the um, share. If you want the um, Foxy development uh, branch, you have to specify that in your Git clone. And so that was something that um, uh, Chad helped otherwise, me. Out otherwise, with. you can just check out that branch. You get the complete uh, repository repository otherwise, and then you check out the branch you are interested in after the clone. You, you, what you say, you check out the... the... The branch you are interested in. Yeah. Well, I was under the impression that if you set it at that and then you went get, you know, you could just get it and get clone. But, you know, he, he turned me on to, I needed to specify the branch and the thing compiled and I'm still having issues with uh, um, uh, navigating and setting a pose, but my local cost map has come back and I'm working, actually I, I'm successful in saving a map. I'm looking on loading it, I'm working on loading it in. And uh, Scott Horton, he is at the uh, Ross discussion group. He gave me some tips on that and I'm looking into that right now. So, but anyways, that's, I just wanted to point out that somebody gave me some help with that. Does anybody else need help on anything particular uh, that they may wanna throw out to the group? Hey, uh, this is Alan. Uh, I, I got something. Dr. Okay. So for the past three months, I've been working on upgrading the Ubiquity robot uh, 1604 image to 2004. And I finally done it. I have a completely working image that supports the Raspi cam and the GPIO, except I've tried to do it six different ways and only one of the ways worked. And what doesn't work is for some reason, I cannot talk to the GPIO pins on boot up. So something grabs them. And if I don't do it in the exact same way, the image won't boot because there's traffic on pins eight and 10. And every recipe I've tried to defeat that doesn't work. The only thing that did work is starting at a 1604 image, upgrading it to 18, upgrading it to 20, getting Ross to work, doing all the overlays. And I suspect it has something to do with the Pi 4's Pi 4 tool chain, but I cannot figure out how to make that the latest greatest 5.4 kernel work. And it seems like if somebody is an expert on tool chains and what the difference between tool chain two versus tool chain three, because I'm just, you know, knocking the rocks together until something works. Is this where you're trying to boot the Pi 4 connected to the Ubiquity controller board? Yep. That's when it fails. When it's when it's everything except using the 5.1, I think it's 5.12 kernel. Whenever I try to do it, it's a 5.4 kernel, doesn't boot. And it looks like it's seeing a console and it's seeing input from the console and says, oh, 
that's the that's someone trying to sign in, and I'm not going to do anything. After that. So it works. Hi, this is Dillo. So it works and boots up completely if the Pi isn't connected to the controller board. That is correct. Okay, so that sounds really suspiciously to me like, yeah, it's waiting on input from a, a serial yeah. port or something I can, like that. I can duplicate it out of the Pi if I just jumper pins eight and 10, that'll stop it from booting. That, that sounds like, um, yeah, it's waiting like on a, on the console or something, something yeah. like that. And I tried everything, you know, they say stop, uh, the serial Getty service, mm -hmm. enable UART one. And apparently it works on one kernel, the 5.1, but not on the 5.4. And there are other things, the way the 5.4 boots is different. It boots into a, the boot firmware area, whereas the older kernel doesn't have a firmware area and it's using a smaller, hmm. there, there are less arguments in there. Are they, I was gonna say, are the, the boot arguments different between the two? No, that's the thing that I have the same, the only difference is the kernel, the boot arguments ah. are the same. All right, let's not get out on the way out in the weeds. But anyway, here. if somebody wants to, I'll yeah, put post my, that. I'll put post my that to the mailing there. list uh, again, Alan. Get there. Yeah. All right. Thank thanks very much. Uh, any more? What I need help with? We need to move along to show and tell. We haven't. We yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got one. Uh, I'm new to. Go ahead, Orin. I'm, I'm new to Ross, and I have a question about Ross serial. If anybody's on the Arduino side of things, go ahead. Um, I, I want to debug the Arduino code, um, but having the, the raw serial, um, raw serial takes up the serial port, so I can't do debug messages like I normally do in Arduino. So any, any advice on like general uh, workflows for doing debugging with raw serial? Hi. Uh, I have a, I have some advice for this. This is Dillo again. Um, use software serial and use two of your digital I.O. ports as a software serial port. And then you open a connection to that. And then you would write your debug messages at that. It's possible to use two of the digital I.O. ports uh, for a bit banged uh, TTL serial. So just look up software serial, software serial, um, software serial Arduino, um, and uh, you sh there should be plenty of examples that follow that. Is that like the TXRX pins? Uh, the T you know the TXRX pins are the that's the main serial. That's what's being like when you just say open serial or when raw serial uses it. Oh, okay. that's, that's what raw serial is using. So you need to use two digital I/O pins. Um, as an alternate serial port. Okay. That'll give also, you a second serial port and then you can write other debug messages out of that. That's really smart, thank you. Oren, put your, put your question on the um, mailing list. And if uh, Dillo's, give, give Dillo a shout out if uh, his uh, suggestion actually helped, okay? I'll, I'll do that, thanks. Thank you, Oren, thank you, Dillo. Any more what I need help with? Hi, uh, me again, hi. Uh, I'm just getting started with ROS2 and I haven't actually really installed anything yet. Um, so well, actually I did install an image on a, a TurtleBot 3, um, but I'm at a point where like, I have two laptops on 1804 and I'm really wondering like, does it make a difference to use dashing versus Foxy? Because I would have to, it looks like for Foxy, I would have to upgrade one to 20. And that's twenty oh four and Foxy is the way to go. Really? Hey, Fergs. Yeah, I was going to pipe in that effectively there's been a huge number of API changes between dashing and then eloquent and then Foxy. And so you're going to have a really nasty time keeping up with most tutorials that are updated only for Foxy and later. Okay. All right. So if I haven't done anything yet, 
uh, then just go ahead and dive in because I'm going to be diving in anyways to what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I'm posting a link into the, the chat uh, to my Ross to cookbook, which okay. will give you some good hints on where to find yeah. sort of documentation yeah. because it I, is I recent, all over the place. I recently <laughs> converted my little turtle bot. I found another enough plates um, so that I converted my turtle bot burger into a waffle. Um, and so it's actually going to be like useful now instead of just cute. And so I'm like, hey, you know, this is a uh, um, new robot to me. So perfect time to just jump into Ross too. Hey, Dillo, if you're uh, working with a nano, be careful. Once you uh, update from 18 to 20, you lose CUDA support. Okay, that's good to know because I'm not planning on uh, upgrading my nano. This is a Pi 4. Yeah. I just post. I just posted a link to Ferg's uh, Robot and Chisel uh, website blog. Okay. Oh, Ralph Hips. Cool. Thanks, gang. Anybody else need help with something? We're going to move into show and tell now. Heavy on the show, light on the tell. I'd like to start this off with my new table bot phase two. Can you see that? Oh, let me pin it. I think I need to pin it. I can see it. Oh, cool. What, what's the goal of the, the robot, just out of curiosity? Well, ro uh, the table bot challenge has three phases. Phase one is to go from one end of the table to the other and back. Phase two is to find a block and knock it off the table. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. And then phase three is to get that block and put it into a shoebox mounted at the end of the table. Thank you very much. That's my show and tell. Anybody else have a show and tell this evening? I'm unpinning myself here. Uh, I do. Uh, uh, Dee, go ahead. Let yeah. Can I uh, share my screen? Um, uh, Chris, can you can you allow uh, Dee Dee to share her screen? I see you, Dee Dee. Let me let me give you rights here. Bear with me. Oh, and um, well, I don't see why you can't. Can, can you try to share a screen and see if you see if you can? Yeah, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Um, I will see what I can do about that. Okay. Wait, that's D Davis. Uh, Chris, yeah, D you Davis. Know, make her a co-host. I think I need to un unpin myself. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Oh, remove pin. There, go. there I go. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, it, it looks like me and another participant also had the similar idea. Uh, so my turtle bot waffle was kind of sitting on the shelf from 2018. Uh, of course, I had done some slams and, and mapping and all that of my kitchen. Uh, but unfortunately, this guy was collecting dust. So uh, I decided to give him an upgrade. I 3D printed some. Uh, um, I designed in a Fusion 360 and then 3D printed uh, some arms and some eyes. Uh, then I did a, um, a two by four matrix of the LEDs. And so then I um, uh, added it to the CR, open CR board. Uh, so you can see the pins there, as well as did the, um, the wiring for the four servos uh, on the open CR board. Uh, a fair amount of uh, uh, test. Uh, testing because when I just use my simple Arduino code uh, just to make sure that uh, it would work uh, with the motors, everything would, would work fine. But then when I integrate the um, uh, the servo code and the light code with the uh, TurtleBot code, uh, it, it interferes with some of the pins. So then uh, it moves uh, some of the pins around so that uh, it's compatible with the TurtleBot code. 
Anyways, yeah, I did the wiring and then added the, it's basically a plate with these slot holes so I can mount it uh, to the lower rack and the upper um, rack of the turtle bot. Uh, I, I 3D printed uh, the raspy cam because the burger uh, doesn't include the raspy cam uh, on there. So, but the, um, the, the bigger one does. So I added it to the burger. And then uh, after a fam round of debugging, uh, of course, that's an honor statement because this is Ross. <laughs> uh, so then I uh, updated the um, the uh, the um, the Arduino code on the OpenCR so that it has a um, code that moves around the eyes, uh, as well as um, I uh, hooked it up to the. Um, uh, the keyboard teleop, so uh, the mouth shape responds to the um, the keyboard prompts, as well as uh, updated the code. So if it's turning to the left, then uh, the eyes will move in the direction that it's turning, and the mouth will also move in the direction that it's turning, and it's moving to the right uh, likewise. So yeah, it's working uh, fine. Uh, let's see. For some reason, it's not. Uh, 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 for some reason, it's not letting me show my video full screen. Uh, that's fine. But you can see the little lighter spinning around. Oh yeah, and the mouse moving around uh, when I'm sending it commands here and there. That's awesome, Dee Dee. So cute. Thank you. So, yeah, I pulled this off the internet uh, just to have like a before and after. So, um, so my next plans was because uh, on my InMove, my humanoid robot that's behind me actually. Oh, I guess you can't really see the head. Okay, yeah. On that's the fourth InMove we oh, built. We see so, InMove back there on your shoulder. Yeah, yeah, hiding next to my light up tree. Anyways, <laughs> I can change the colors. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, I had done the AMIL on that uh, second InMove that we had built. So I'm looking forward uh, to porting all those AM AMIL files onto this one. And it's nice because uh, uh, I don't really have to turn on any motors. To what is AMIL? Uh, that's the chat box. So you talk to it, it talks back to you. So um, with the InMove, it has a huge amount of AMIL files. So you can put in your... Um, uh, if someone says a keyword, uh, then it will pick uh, the responses based on the hierarchies of the keywords. Uh, and I, so I added to it for sure. And it, like uh, there's a whole joke sub, sub engine and it already had a, um, uh, uh, what the paper rock scissors game on there. But uh, so lots of fun stuff. So I'm looking forward. I hadn't used that. Uh, done any of the chatbot stuff for a couple of years. So I'm really um, excited to port it over to something that's so nice and small on my desk. Uh, and then um, uh, also, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, the face recognition. Uh, so it moves around with the face recognition and there's a couple other features I wanna test out on this mini thing. But yeah, it's basically turning around from a navigation robot to a, a mini social robot and plan with the upgrades. So any other questions? Very fine. Oh, thank you. That's, that's cute and awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, look at, looking forward to seeing that at the challenge meeting next month. Yes. I'm so happy to have a graduated from really, really scary uh, not that there's nothing wrong with really super creepy robots. I have my share to uh, adorable That's cute. A big share. <laughs> <laughs> and my son behind me has comments about the proportion of creepy, scary robots to <laughs> adorable, cute robots. So we're fans we of the Uncanny Valley. <laughs> Wayne, do you want to talk about HR2? Okay, sure. Um... Let's see. Can I don't I can't see my screen. Can you is my um, screen showing up? 
Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. yes. I've got your okay. Senate speaker view, so we can see you fine. Okay. So uh, let's see. This is uh, HR2. And um, uh, I'm not sure if I have this thing centered right. I actually can't see my, my own uh, camera view at the moment. Okay. But this good. is a can see the robot. You can see the robot. Okay, fine. I just can't tell. So this is the uh, the Pololu Rami base, which we used for the FPGA class yeah, about 18 months ago. Uh, I my, I have designed a, a board here, and uh, James Nugent helped me work on this board as well. And this thing has got seven sonars on it, five in the front and two in the back. Okay. And uh, it's got some encoder, some really nice encoders on here uh, that are based on the Pololu encoders, although I had to make a custom encoder board. And then this has the Pololu arm on it, so it can do arm challenges and stuff. I don't have the greatest range of motion yet. Okay, now people are showing it to me. Okay, so now I can get this right. So as you can see, we can move, move the arm up and twist it and all that stuff. Okay. Um, and uh, and then on top here is the battery, and uh, the battery can uh, run for quite a while. Actually, it's a pr pretty beefy battery. All the weights on the back of this robot, so it's it's uh, the, 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 it's got basically tri tricycle uh, suspension. There is a front uh, s floating ball here for the uh, so if you are driving forward, it'll it won't you know, nose plant. Okay. And then the uh, processor board for the microcontroller is a Nucleo 144 from uh, ST Microelectronics. And uh, we have been able to put blinking on it. Uh, blinking means we can just blink the LEDs. And then hiding deep under there, and I won't be able to show it to you. You just, you just cannot see it through all the noise. There's a Raspberry Pi 4 to run the ROS on because this is a ROS robot. Okay. And then up here on the very top is a... Um, LiDAR that uh, James found on the net, uh, which is very small. I mean, I just, it's hard to describe how small it is. There's, you can't see any moving parts. Every, everything that moves is inside of this thing. It's about $100. Uh, it's a That's LDO. Tiny. It's really tiny. Okay. Who makes uh, that? It's, uh, I think it's LD Robotics. It's based out of uh, China. And this is called an LD06. Okay. And um, I, I don't have the link with me, but I'm pretty sure James will, will f fish it up and post it to the, the link if, if, if he, can, he can find it because he's at the meeting tonight. So uh, we're going we're gonna to build four or five of these things. This is the Rev A board. Um, and this is ultimately going to be hopefully a, a robot that people can uh, play with. Um, and uh, we're going to I'm going to we're going to try and put together some materials so that people we can show people how to program the microcontroller and write write firmware for it and stuff like that. So that's the the, the upgrade. Hopefully uh, by the next March, we'll uh, have it running around. OK, so that's my thing. Any questions? I think we're going to take that as a no. OK, thank you very much. Well done. Looking forward to seeing that uh, move around next month. Okay, any more show and tell? Ralph Hips, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know if you can hear me okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, could use a little more volume. Yeah, I got this uh, uh, <clears throat> webcam and it's a little funky. It doesn't, uh, the mic on it doesn't work super well. I'll try, okay. to talk, I'll try to talk extra loud. Can you hear me okay now? We hear you. All right. Um, so, um, anyway, mine's really quick, um, and, uh, sorry, I messed with the camera. So, everybody knows what this is, right? You see these? It's just micro SD card. So, oh, I'm yeah. just doing a quick update on what I, um, a problem I've had with the Arduino for a long time, anybody that's an Arduino user. Uh, you have the USB cable for doing your serial monitor, which you, you for, use for debug, right? If you're doing debug on an Arduino. And the USB cable can be a problem for a number of reasons, right? It gets wrapped around things. You've got to follow the robot around. If it's a small bot, the cable, the weight of the cable can kind of tug on it and cause it to pull left, right, whatever. There's some issues with that. So anyway, I was trying to figure out ways to get around that issue. Looked into Bluetooth and a bunch of things, but you, you can't really send from the robot real, real well with Bluetooth. You can send to the robot, but that's not what I wanted. 
Anyway, so the idea to try out the micro SD cards. And so I've got, to, I tried out, and it sits at a number of adapters. You can kind of see, I mean, there's just the Adafruit one, which is kind of the biggest one. And then there's a couple of, this is a level shifting one from SparkFun. Uh, here's another one that has no level shifter, so three volt systems only. It's pretty small. Well, you're going to have the smallest one of all is this guy from SparkFun. And it's uh, got an, another uh, AT mega processor, AT328, I think, on the back. It's an Arduino on, a, on the back of the card. And that Arduino buffers all the serial <laughs> traffic coming to it. So basically, you can take a 32 gig card, stick it in here, and from your serial port, just one pin, the TX pin, hook it to this thing, and you can stream with a class 30 card, you can stream at 115.2 baud, all your debug information, and you just stream it as you would if you had a cable in your laptop. And it takes all the, uh, all the traffic without any hiccups or anything, no problem at all, and uh, you can capture all your debug data. And the beauty of this is you don't have a cable anymore. When you finish your test run, you just pull the micro SD out, stick it in your laptop, and pull up the data and look at it. It's already in a text file. You don't have to go into the serial monitor and highlight everything and copy and paste it into a text file so you can search through it later, stuff like that. If you're in Arduino land, you're kind of maybe familiar with these issues. But um, anyway, this should solve it nicely. And uh, I'm really happy about it. I'm, and I'm buying these open logs, this little tiny guy. I've already bought like six of them because <laughs> I'm going to put one on every bot. Anyway, I thought it was a big... Breakthrough for Arduino folks. So, if any questions? Just let me know. Is that allowing you to communicate with the Arduino wirelessly, or it's recording data? It's just a local recorder, like a local bag file. Think of it as a Ross bag file, or I guess, you know, from what I know about bag files. So it's on the bot, local on the bot. This tiny little board, you know, you, this little itty bitty little thing. I'm sure you can find room for it, right? And the, the 32 gig micro SD card goes in there, and boom, you've got a ton of storage, right? I I streamed for 90 seconds, and I think it was, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was like 500 kilobytes or something. I mean, so it's for data collection on an Arduino. Data collection on the Arduino, right? You just stream all your stuff to it, and uh, cool. then it later. Yeah. Do we have any other demos this evening? Real, real quick question, Ralph. That's yeah. two ways, right? You, The Arduino can actually read back data from there. So basically, you've given your Arduino a mini hard drive? Yes, you could do that. Yes, absolutely. Read and write. Yeah. It takes uh, like a, yeah. It's like a little flight data recorder for your robot. Um, yeah, you know, like a little black box for your robot. You know, it's exactly it. It's a black box. It's a flight data recorder for the Arduino. Exactly. And it's uh, yeah, I'm very excited about it. Can you tell? Yeah, really cool. Uh, I just want to say I, I also use Arduino and have used uh, um, a Adafruit uh, Feather Shield or uh, Feather that actually has one of those in it. Uh -huh. And I think that use case of like, I've got my stuff set up and I want to run my robot around and see like, okay, it broke right then. And yes. then that's, that's a good idea. So right. thanks. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then the data follow and you debug it, figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. Another follow up question. Now, is this data only or would you be able to, for example, because the Arduino has limited memory for program space, could you have program modules that it could download and execute? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That might be possible. probably not. Huh? Yeah, probably not. Yeah, probably not. But uh, yeah, you could store some parameters that it would read in for configuring certain things that it would use while it's running. So it would load some stuff into RAM, you know, like a list of offsets or calibration constants or you know things like that. You could do that certainly. And then me, load, me. If you modify them in, as you're running along, you could write them back out. So next time you load the updates, things like that. Yeah. Maybe maybe able to do like a assembly level stuff, but that's still kind of yeah difficult. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how you get it to execute that. There may be a way, but I just I just don't know how. All right. Any more any more demos this evening? Say something. Oh, say, say quick comment, Camp. The LDO six links have been posted in the chat room. Oh, very fine. The uh, little uh, lidar that's on the uh, HR two is uh, been posted to the chat. Any other demos this evening before we move into our main presentation? Uh, Camp, I have something, but I got to set it up. So maybe after the presentation, if we have time, you can show it. Random access. That sounds good. We have some random access. Uh, entertainment um, from Tom I, and Dr. Schmidt after the meeting. Say, I can answer questions about the InMove uh, that's right next to me if you'd like. Oh, okay. 
Oh, we always got time for an in move um, yes. demo. Yeah, so this in move uh, built a couple years ago uh, has a modification of a screen on uh, top of it uh, on the front. So that's a little different from the typical in move, uh, but it does have. Uh, it's running a Raspberry Pi on the back. Actually, there's two of them on there here. Uh, so here's one of the Raspberry Pis. With, Did he, uh, do you want bunch. Skynet? <laughs> <laughs> well, with three humanoids in the house, uh, we're, our human to robot ratio is uh, pretty low. So Turn him but, around, get him in the center of the screen so I can get a nice snapshot. <laughs> there we go. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, so but cool. uh, in case there's a robot uprising, we're uh, expecting these guys to defend us <laughs> with uh, jokes uh, because they don't have arms. So <laughs> that's on the to-do list, but obviously uh, uh, we're uh, multitasking here. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. Very cool. All right, any more demos this evening? before we move to the presentation. Any more demos, speak up. We're moving to the presentation. Say, uh, Joseph, would you like to uh, introduce our guest? Hi, everybody. Um, so today we, our presenter is Dr. Uh, Suk Vu of Omni Labs. Um, he's a co-founder and CEO um, you know, we're very lucky to Joseph, you're muted. Joseph, you're muted. The audio must have cut out there. <laughs> Um, so we, we got to get things moving along. Our presenter has to run here shortly. Um, but yeah, our presenter is Dr. Thuk Vu of Omni Labs. He is the co-founder and CEO. Uh, we're very lucky to have him. You know, thanks for being here and take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Thuk and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Omni Labs. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, you know, seeing a lot of really exciting things that you guys are working on. Uh, so, you know, thanks for, for inviting me and, and for uh, sharing these things with me. Um, so, uh, I, my apologies, uh, I do have to leave uh, in a bit. And so I'm going to try to go through um, the, the slides uh, a bit faster. Uh, but, you know, feel free to jump in with questions or comments uh, anytime. Um, okay, so uh, today I, I would like to tell you a bit about our story and you know our approach uh, to robotics development. Uh, so it's been a really interesting journey. Uh, we started from in 2015. Uh, we based in Silicon Valley, um, and uh, it's been a really exciting uh, journey for us, uh, especially with the pandemic, right? And so you probably all uh, you know seen the pandemic has accelerated greatly uh, the adoption of robotic solution. Um, so we've seen a, a jump in demands across multiple verticals, uh, you know, from uh, verticals that have been uh, sort of getting robotics attention, like logistic, cleaning, uh, security, uh, to something really new, uh, like virtual tourism, you know, allowing people to go visit uh, places remotely, uh, or telecommuting, you know, allowing people to conduct their business uh, also remotely through the robot. Uh, but there's still a big gap between the demands and uh, the uh, so solutions available. And the reason is it actually uh, costs a lot uh, to get to production, right? Um, you know, to, to really productionize a robotics product, uh, it will take 10 to 20 million and a couple of years uh, to get there. Right? So this will make the price of the robot uh, really high uh, and is really prevent the mass adoption uh, for the product. Uh, and you know, even when you have the product already, uh, it's never perfect, right? You need to go through multiple iteration uh, to really fit into the, 
use cases, um, the verticals. Uh, and that's also by itself, this is so inexpensive. Um, and so the way, uh, this is how we fit in. Uh, basically, we providing what we call a robotics platform as a service. So enterprises come to us with very specific use cases in mind with features they need. Uh, and we'll provide them with rapid prototyping service that allow them to really get to a prototype quickly uh, to test it out, to see if there's you know, uh, value, if there's good product market fit. And then we can help them to continue to scale out production uh, so that they can quickly get to the market uh, at a much lower cost and faster speed. And then once the robots are deployed, we'll continue to provide um, uh, cloud AI and robotic services um, you know, to enable advanced uh, capabilities for these robots. And so what we call this is um, an end-to-end -end robotic uh, solution. So we can sort of fit into a really interesting space here. Uh, you know, like uh, to make one or two prototypes is not uh, too difficult, right? Uh, to make, let's say 10,000 uh, of robots uh, is doable as well. Uh, you can just go find some CMs um, in Asia to help you do this, right? Uh, but if you want to make like hundreds to a thousand, for example, uh, right now there's no uh, efficient way uh, to, to let you do this. Uh, you know, otherwise uh, the cost is going to end up way too high, right? And so we sort of fit into this uh, interesting space right now. And the goal for us is to help uh, partners, customers, enterprises develop hundreds of different types of robots. And hopefully we can uh, manufacture and deploy millions of them uh, for, for these types. A bit about our secret sauce, the way that we approach the uh, robotics development uh, is that, you know, we're starting out with uh, several extensible and flexible based platform. Uh, and we build a library of tech modules, uh, kind of like a building blocks that can uh, allow us to quickly customize the robot based on the, the needs of the clients or the customers. And then we we'll tie it all together with a really unique process of manufacturing uh, using 3D printing. And so we actually 3D print uh, the part uh, or the integrations right um, between the, these modules um, and manufacture them uh, all in Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm going to show you some uh, photos uh, you know, shortly. Uh, but we call this horizontal approach to robotics. And it allows us to significantly cut down the cost uh, to develop one uh, robotics product. So this is our, uh, these are some of the uh, modular platform we uh, starting out with. Um, you know, whether it is, uh, we designed it so that we can swap in and out certain parts very easily, adding more sensors um, or, you know, adding uh, uh, different components onto the robot. Uh, here's an example of the modules that we're developing. Uh, we have uh, developed uh, like, you know, like the, uh, the S drive, the arm, uh, the UV component for cleaning, uh, the main board, the display. Um, and so these are the library that allow us to, uh, you know, uh, iterate through them very quickly uh, when we build a new robot. So here's an example of, you know, the uh, robots that could be developed from our library. Um, you know, it, it's actually, we're reusing 80 to 90% uh, of the existing technology. Uh, but you can see that the, the form factor at the end could be, you know, very different that uh, can be optimized to the uh, use cases, whether it's telepresent, whether it's concierge robots, whether it's security uh, or indoor delivery robot. And this is uh, our factory. Uh, this is where all the uh, fun part happening. <laughs> so we have rows and rows of three printers in our facility in San Jose uh, and just crank out parts days and nights. Uh, and, you know, we assemble these parts uh, to make these robots you can see here at the top uh, right hand side. We design and build out uh, printers as well. Uh, this is fifth generation already. And so, you know, we, we actually using uh, the previous generation printers to print and build the next generation, right? <laughs> so it's a very uh, virtuous cycle here. Um, but these printers allow us to have much higher yield, much better finish of the parts, 
um, and you know much easier to do maintenance. You know we can just replace you know, some of the components that uh, go bad, right? Um, and we also do pre preventive uh, maintenance. So basically, we gather a lot of data, uh, for, you know, add sensors, camera onto these printers uh, to measure when we should replace certain parts. Uh, because you know, uh, disruption, you know, like the parts uh, failure is actually a lot of uh, cost, right? You know, some uh, each of these batch, uh, we usually do two batch per day. Uh, you know, each of the batch can be ten to twelve hours, and so you know, like when the batch go wrong, that means ten hours was uh, wasted, right? And so we try to do preventive maintenance uh, for for these um, uh, for our process, um, and uh, yeah. What else should I talk about? I was gonna say something here, um, but I think we believe that this is gonna be uh, the future uh, for manufacturing, uh, especially you know with the uh, advance in terms of multi-material uh, 3D printers. Uh, so it could be really interesting to to mix. Uh, plastic and and uh, metal uh, for these. Okay, so here's some example uh, of some of the uh, project that we have done. Um, so, for you know, we work with uh, on Nippon Airway ANA from Japan, one of the largest uh, airlines in the world, and they came to us in 2019 uh, with an idea of revolutionize um, the traveling. Uh, space uh, by robotics. So they believe the future of traveling is actually through uh, robotics avatar and uh, not no longer flying. And so we help them to get from ideation to, to prototype to production within only six months uh, in 2019. And all this happened way before the COVID pandemic, right? So the timing was uncanny. Uh, but in 2020, uh, we helped them manufacture five new robots. And in 2021, uh, they planning to do uh, OEM for the 5,000 robot. Um, you can see the uh, form factor of the robot uh, is actually very different to our uh, flagship model, uh, but a lot of the under the hood components are uh, reused here. And so this allows us to you know, uh, get to production so quickly, only six months. Uh, here's another vertical that we've been uh, working in, uh, which is healthcare. Uh, especially with the pandemic, um, we have been deployed in more than 30 hospitals worldwide and helping to connect patients, COVID patients, especially uh, with their families, with nurses and doctors. Um, so we can integrate our robot very easily with uh, other vital sign devices. Um, so you can see the, um, the robot on the left hand side, uh, you know, adding uh, devices, adding kind of a carrying tray for food and medicine. And here's another really interesting use case we've been working on, uh, UV cleaning robots. And so basically, you know, same, again, same base, uh, which is add a UV cleaning component on top of it. Uh, and then the robot can drive around to clean the space. And so this uh, UV cleaning, UV light is very effective um, uh, against, uh, you know, coronavirus, against bacteria, uh, but it's harmful to use uh, around people. And so this is a perfect application uh, for robots. And, you know, we get uh, to this prototype within only one month. Um, and you, the uh, final production version would be uh, at one tenth of the cost of existing robots, uh, like the UVD uh, or AVA uh, in the market. So here's some uh, roadmap that we have uh, in mind. Uh, we're starting out with the telepresent robot. Uh, to tackle a couple of different use cases uh, on you know, telecommuting, healthcare, education, senior care, or virtual tourism. Uh, and now we're going uh, more towards you know, launching autonomy platform and robotics uh, vision perception engine uh, so that we can unlock uh, additional use cases uh, for this. Uh, and 2022 uh, is when we aiming to launch some robotics arm. Uh, it's going to be very exciting. Uh, so basically allowing um, us to, uh, allowing the robots to manipulate and interact with uh, objects in the environment, right? And so now th that's where uh, a lot more use cases can be uh, unlocked. Um, 
here is our uh, flagship robot. Uh, we're starting out with the telepresence robot. Uh, you know, basically it's designed to be very easy to use, very easy to set up, uh, affordable. Uh, right now the cost is $2,700. Um, and um, uh, you can dial in and control the robot uh, from any, uh, any tablet, smartphone, laptop, computers. And so uh, we designed this for the um, communication use case. Uh, that's where we started out. Um, but we have seen a lot of uh, people requesting us to build interesting application on top of this base platform. And so that's why we launched, uh, we started to go down the route of the developer platform, uh, you know, opening it up uh, so that it can be uh, extensible in terms of hardware, uh, so that it can be programmable in terms of software. Um, you can go to find more information about this dev platform on, on our website. Um, the link is here if you want to write down onrelabs.com slash products slash dev platforms with the S. Um, but essentially uh, this, you know, when, when we start opening this up, we started to get um, some really interesting idea uh, around, you know, what can we take this uh, uh, platform uh, to, you know, what different use cases and, and application. Uh, and that's where you saw some of the project like ANA, uh, like the UV cleaning robots uh, were coming from. Uh, a, little bit, a little bit about uh, our developer platform. Uh, we have, four, uh, we provide four layers uh, of APIs for maximum flexibility. The highest layers, Web API and native JS uh, offer the higher abstraction API to enable application developer to quickly develop uh, application on top of our telepresent robot stack. While the lower level Docker and kernel offer lower level access for robotics developers um, to freely explore the different functionality of service robot. Uh, you, as you probably aware, right, to build a good telepresent stack is actually quite challenging. Um, and so, uh, we have had a lot of people interested in, you know, just leveraging uh, what we've spent a lot of effort in building out uh, to build their own custom application. Um, a bit more uh, details about the API. So uh, for our web API, uh, basically you can develop any web application with a set of JavaScript API uh, to control the robot behavior. And you can quickly de uh, deploy uh, this new behavior uh, through our web interface uh, or, you know, uh, on the robot directly. Um, here you can see some of the example of the function call uh, for, for the um, APIs. By the way, all of these are available on our website, uh, docs.armylabs.com, uh, if you want to take a closer look. Um, for the native JS, uh, basically it's a Node.js based control infrastructure uh, that allow you to uh, modify the robot behaviors. So there are two ways you can do it. One is through the Boss Shell API, uh, essentially a rich socket API and comments uh, so that you can interface with the low level robot hardware without really diving into the uh, low level code. And then a plugin system so that you can load and deploy uh, the code into a Node.js control system. Um, some example, like you can write custom logic to drive Omni uh, with a Bluetooth controller or RF controller um, or you can write custom logic to integrate some uh, sensor, like ultrasonic sensor, um, so that you can display different messages uh, on the robot. And Docker and ROS, uh, we built it, the, our OS with a powerful Docker visualization. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, to give you maximum flexibility. Um, you basically, you can just, uh, you know, uh, uh, build a Docker image, push it to robot and run it. Uh, and so you can do you know, really cool things with, for example, ROS, right? So that you can do um, autonomous navigation with ROS, uh, or you can do OpenCV uh, as one of those um, Docker, uh, or you can run Slam code. Um, so, you know, really open up uh, a whole slew of different ways that you can uh, play around with this uh, infrastructure. And then uh, at the lowest level, is a kernel um, basically allow you to recompile uh, our kernel so that you can add new device driver. Um, for example, 
we have we support multiple different boards like the up extreme um, or up square. Okay, here's my uh, most favorite part <laughs> of uh, the presentation, right? Uh, show and tell. Um, so let me give you some example uh, of the uh, application we've been running. So this is a follow me uh, application. And so the robot is doing um, tracking of the, the uh, uh, of my co-founder uh, CTO Jared here and just following his uh, uh, body. So we actually developed this on uh, two layers. Um, you know, one is a Docker running body detection and tracking uh, connected with the Coral TPU from Google uh, to do edge AI processing. And then the second one is a Node.js uh, uh, module to get detection data from the Docker and then convert it into the, the control command for the robot, uh, whether, you know, uh, how to follow uh, the person. And uh, this one is a real-time object recognition also using um, the uh, HAI device. Uh, so the robot is driving around and you know, would, would pre-train some of the uh, object classes and then we'll just push down to the robot to do inference on the edge. And then uh, here example uh, of some obstacle avoidance uh, with various sensor. Um, here's the, on the top right hand side, you see the robot is avoiding obstacle using LIDAR. Um, or uh, with a death sensing camera. Um, Yep, the essence camera is attached in the middle part there. Um, or RGB camera. So this is quite exciting. Uh, you know, um, we want to explore further to see whether we can really push for vision um, to detect the obstacle and then um, allowing the robot to plan around the obstacle. And this is sort of putting all of these together uh, for like an application uh, from mapping a space uh, to, you know, uh, remember location uh, so that, we, you know, uh, point of interest so that you, you can say, go from room A to room B. Um, so all of this, we're planning to release it as uh, API. Uh, so that let's say you want to View some really cool application, but you don't want to like dive into um, navigation, right? Then you can just call this API, uh, like you know, uh, get map, uh, you know, uh, mark uh, point of interest, or navigate from point A to point B. And um, last but not least, so this is another prototype that we have in-house. So this is a, a 3D printed arms that being remotely controlled uh, through a VR set uh, over the internet. And you can see the arm is, is quite responsive, low latency, uh, lightweight, uh, but high torque. Uh, we actually 3D print this arm, you know, the joints are all 3D printed. Uh, and we designed uh, it, it in such a way that it's, you know, it's a very low cost, 
uh, the whole arm can be built for less than $500. Um, and, you know, uh, the hope is that we can start to experiment this with this arm, letting people play around with it and, and see if there are some cool application uh, they can build um, uh, surround it. Um, um, I think I will uh, skip the, um, the team. Um, we have some really interesting advisory uh, board, uh, like uh, James Kovner, you probably heard of him um, uh, in the robotics space, right? He's right now the CEO of Toyota Research Institute for Advanced Development, uh, also on the board of director of Toyota, or Meno Velasco, uh, probably the, um, uh, the grand uh, mother of uh, robo soccer. <laughs> uh, she was our advisor back then at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and you know, that's how we got all the interest uh, starting from uh, me and Jared. We were roommate at Carnegie Mellon uh, and we did a lot of research um, in this space with Manuel Veloso. Uh, and so that's, that's how the, the whole uh, journey uh, started. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, we are hiring. Uh, you know, if you know someone who are uh, would be a good uh, fit for a mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, uh, hardware director, uh, please let us know. Um, here's a link uh, to the job posting. Um, uh, you can use both both link um, to access those. <laughs> Thank you. Do you mind post? Thank, thanks for your talk. Uh, do you mind posting those links into the chat if possible? Yep, absolutely. I will do that. Yeah, I would also suggest posting those in the news group as well as the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can help take care of that. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Dr. Vu, have you developed your own framework or uh, uh, do you use Ross? So uh, we we develop our own framework, uh, but we um, we can integrate uh, with Ross very easily because uh, we you know we know Ross is the standard right uh, of the uh, open source um, community. So um, you can just you know deploy Ross very easily on our robot, uh, but we wrap around it with the Docker. I had a question about the Docker. Um, I've been using mm -hmm. Docker on Raspberry Pi for a while. And I'm kind of curious, like what the um, the process for integrating or like uh, having uh, Docker containers like reach into the, the hardware and what that looks like. Um, I'm probably not gonna be the the best person uh, to answer you this question. <laughs> if you shoot me an email, I'll be more than happy to connect you with um, my technical director, uh, so that he can yeah uh, provide a much better answer for you. Love that. So your yeah, Omni robot is as is, is not autonomous, it's uh, teleoperated, right? Uh, the one that we're uh, selling in the market is uh, teleoperated. Uh, we have a better version of autonomous uh, with, you know, depth sensing camera with LiDAR. Uh, that will be released uh, probably in Q3 of this year. How many robots have you guys sold? Uh, we have sold a couple thousand uh, so far uh, and, you know, deploy worldwide. Um, last count was more than 40 countries. <laughs> um, it's not easy. Yeah, it's, it's not easy. It's been an interesting journey. Um, and Michael Wimble had a uh, comment. Thank you. On the, the cost. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, we've been trying really hard to keep the cost down. Um, it, in some sense, it's the, the three printing approach actually allowing us to do this uh, because rather than, you know, if you go to a CM in Asia, right, you have to commit to like a much higher volume uh, and you, you get stuck uh, with that. Um, so you cannot really modify changing it, you know, fixing stuff. Uh, but with, with three printing, let's say, you know, we'll, we have a bug, uh, we need to fix it, we we'll just send it to the printer and we can test out the model the next day. Um, so it's really, really um, allow us to iterate, you know, a lot faster and, and save a lot of costs um, in the process. So uh, your payload looks like it's a little light. 
especially for a delivery robot. So it seems like you have a ruggedized, a more rugged or more robust version. Mm -hmm. Yep, we do. Uh, so the, um, the AMR modular platform that you see in the, the pictures, uh, those have a uh, much higher payload. Uh, so right now, the, um, uh, the, the Omni SS uh, probably can carry about 10 pounds of payload, uh, but the other one you know, will, uh, can go up to like 40, 50 pounds. Um, and the really cool thing is we have different um, uh, drive with different uh, loads of motors. And so you know, it, depending on the use cases or the needs of our customer, we can actually customize it. Yeah, it look, even so, it looks like some of those robots are so top heavy that they're gonna mm -hmm. get a bump and tip over. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the uh, telepresent robot uh, is designed, you know, that way so that it is actually for the ease of communication. Uh, but the platform, uh, maybe I can look for like a photo uh, here. The platform, the other platform uh, are designed to actually, you know, be, you know, like very low gravity, mm -hmm. center of gravity, right? Like uh, all, the one to, all the way to the uh, left-hand side. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks for the question. Any last question? Um, what are, oh, go ahead. Uh, what are some of the challenges of like getting a, um, like getting like a robotic arm down to a price that's like in the hundred dollar range that still like fulfills the uh, requirements of getting something moving and it's usable? Yeah, I think the, the challenge would be the torque, right? Um, or like the payload for, for this arm. Uh, when you continue to cut down the cost, uh, you cannot use expensive motors. Um, and so the, with the cheaper motors, uh, the precision is not there and also the payload is not there. Uh, um, and so you know, that's, that's where we see uh, some of the challenges have been uh, coming from. Um, we continue to experiment with something like, for example, a 3D printed harmonic drive to see whether we can kind of marry, you know, the best of both worlds uh, while keeping the cost low. Uh, it's, it's still uh, work in the pipeline. Um, but yeah, you know, these are like really interesting uh, questions or R&D projects. Uh, if, you know, you guys um, uh, want to take a stab, want to, you know, chat more with us, we'll be happy to. Thanks. Thank you very uh, Dr. much. Dr. Vu, I, I had a question. Um, what kind of 3D material printing, what kind of material are you using for the 3D printer for the arms? And is, are uh, you getting we, enough, we, you know, are mm -hmm. they rigid enough for the kind of torque that you're experiencing? Yeah, we just use uh, PLA uh, for this. And, you know, it's really interesting. So we design, we completely think, uh, rethink about this uh, from the design perspective as uh, designed for 3D printing, right? Oh, and so, no. so we can add different structure uh, support into, you know, like uh, parts that need, you know, heavy load, right? So for example, like the base, we add like a lot of uh, rigs to like, you know, kind of like uh, um, support it, uh, which is, will be harder to do with the injection molding, for example. Uh, and then we can also play around with the density of the prints. Right. And so, you know, if you really need like a solid piece, it could be like, you know, completely filled in or, you know, like 80% filled in or something like that. Uh, but for the, the part that's more like, you know, cosmetic, uh, then you can actually keep it, you know, very hollow inside to reduce the cost, to reduce the time to print, um, to reduce the chance of failure um, for, the, for the print. And so, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like a whole um, a mindset approach. Uh, to this rather than say, yeah, why don't we just convert, uh, uh, you know, a part to 3 print it. Yeah, so I hope okay, that's, that's great. Thanks. Yeah. It did. Thank you. You print your wheels? Uh, we used to <laughs> print our wheels, 
uh, now we just, you know, get it, uh, you know, made uh, by large volume. Yeah, wheel doesn't change anymore, right? So. Uh, no reason to reinvent the wheel, huh? That's exactly right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, very nice uh, meeting you all. So. We meet the last Wednesday every month, so feel free to log in. Will do, will do. Yeah, take care. Thanks very Thank much. You. Great Thank presentation. Bye-bye. All right, folks, that uh, concludes the presentation portion of our meeting uh, this evening. We're moving into random access now. Say, Thomas, I think you had something to show us, didn't you? You're on. Hey, everybody, how you doing? All right. Um, all right, good. So the first thing I want to show you is I just got a new servo motor. It's, uh, I don't know if you can see that. It's 60, uh, let me take off the background, hold on. Virtual, you know, there should be a button right on top. Turn it on, turn it off. So it's a 60, um, kilo, uh, what is it, kilogram centimeter. And this is the, uh, highest uh, standard, well, it's, this is the larger jumbo servo, I guess you call this, that I could find. And there's a reason why I needed this, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. It comes with a nice set of brackets too. They're all aluminum, uh, good for, you know, this kind of thing. Um, so I, I forget what the price was, about $50, $60 or something. It wasn't too bad. Um, Second thing I wanted to show off is I'm working on a new project. It's going to be in Servo Magazine, they're telling me, this month's issue. I'm not sure if it hit the uh, online yet. Uh, this is uh, Open Fembot, we're calling it. And uh, it's the, uh, the project is to build a human-like robot with uh, animatronic robot with uh, silicone rubber skin. And I'll show you how far it's gotten so far. And I, we have a lot of people on the team here. And some of the people are here who are on the team, uh, or at least they were. I don't know if they're still online here. Uh, a few people have dropped off already. Walter's on the team. Say hi, Walter. Walter Martinez. So this is what uh, we've gotten so far. I'll show you uh, right now together because I've been working on it. So I, I had to just make it somewhat presentable. Uh, this is Simone. And you can see she's got rubber on her face. Silicone rubber. Her hand is rubber. A rubber hand. The, uh, the fingers are not articulated. Not on this model anyway. Um, and she's got rubber on her chest here. And her feet are rubber. And the pedestal under her is a remote control pedestal. I call it the chariot. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of lost in space nostalgia there. Hey, Thomas, I want to get a good screenshot. Can you pull back and let me get a good screenshot of these robots? That's BB-8 right next to them. That, that's a BB-8 lamp. <laughs> Let's see, right about there, is that good? Hang on, let me get one more. That's, per, uh, hang on, hang on, perfect, thank you. Yeah, we're gonna be uh, showing people how to build these on uh, <clears throat> Servo Magazine. You, you've all, well, I'm sure most of you have heard of Servo Magazine. It's a big uh, hobbyist robotics magazine, if you haven't. So I just wanted to show you some of the, the things I have gotten working here. Let me get this uh, going here, I'm gonna, Plug in my servo tester. I don't have the circuit connected because that would have taken me another 60 minutes. And I'm just going to show you a few of the servos running. That's all. And just straight servos right out to uh, to the back of her through a hole. Well, she's got a lot of holes. But... <laughs> Wait, that didn't come out right. Okay, so this one is her neck, as you can see. Looks a little like Elvis. Yeah. 
Her head and uh, upper torso are based on an Elvis Presley, uh, the Elvis Alive animatronic figure. Saves us about uh, two years in engineering. Oh, you're killing me. <laughs> and, and I've got the uh, eyelid glued. Yeah. And it's working. Whoa. Can you see that? Can you see that? Let, me, let, me, let me turn it around. I'm very proud of that because it took me a long time to get that working. Hang on a sec. Hey, Thomas? Yeah? Can you do that one more time? My wife wants to see it. <laughs> you should have seen me putting this on. I glued my fingers together three or four times. <laughs> it takes a very special um, Not the uh, glue. It's, uh, it's a super glue, but it's a variant that sticks to the rubber. Nance, Nance says you should do that with the lip. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the jaw, let me see, which is the jaw here? <laughs> oh, she's oh that's soft. good. <laughs> and because this is on top of an Elvis, she does, <laughs> she does have teeth. <laughs> Okay, wow. top and bottom, like a horse right showing the teeth. Freaky. <laughs> um, one of the problems I had with it is the rubber was really tough and the motor kept uh, stripping out on me. So right now there's nothing connecting the head to the chest. Ideally, eventually it's gonna be one solid piece of rubber from top to bottom, but I have to upgrade the motors. Are you doing this? Are you doing the silicone casting yourself? Oh, no, I'm buying all these parts off of uh, Amazon.com and eBay. You didn't know you could buy this off of eBay. So uh, right now, I'm upgrading her elbow motors. You can see the uh, rubber only goes to here. And this is you know, engineering, right? It's not, it's not what I thought it would be. Uh, this motor is actually way underrated for the weight of this arm. I didn't expect it to be, well, I didn't measure anything. I just got, got grabbed the most uh, strongest motor I could find, which at, a year ago was 20 kilogram centimeters. But now I got this 60 and that's the whole purpose of the 60 because uh, it will lift the arm up very well because the 20 gives me a little bit of lift, but I'm afraid I'm going to burn it out. Yeah. Uh, so when you, when you get a chance, there's a question on the chat. Where did you get that servo? Uh, I can post it in the uh, chat link. Yeah, no the problem. The shoulder is just a simple servo motor. Anyway, the whole idea of this was keep it simple, stupid. So, uh, and that's, that's a 60 there, but the 60 here <clears throat> is not strong enough. Uh, it only lifts the motor about, the arm up about uh, 20 degrees. So I have a new one coming that's 400 kilogram centimeters. Uh, directly from China. Uh, I'm not sure when it's coming, probably next month, I'm guessing, sometime mid-March or April. And nice software. <laughs> You're funny, Cam. All right. And this is her name is Simone. Uh, we're using Easy Robot. To, for all of her artificial intelligence and for her, just her motion, her uh, to interface to her motors, we're using <clears throat> uh, what is it? AIML for her personality. Uh, God, that's the biggest piece of problem that that is. Uh, I was, I think I was chatting with one, one of the other people here. Uh, AIML is an interesting thing to work with, and eventually you figure out. Out of the box, it does absolutely nothing you want it to do. And it takes literally hundreds of hours to get it to do what you want it to do. At least that's been my experience. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the Easy Robot is a nice interface. It provides uh, the software and hardware interfaces all in one box. I sound like a DJ, right? <laughs> I could have been a salesman for DJ show. Yeah. I keep asking them to hire me, but I don't know if I can handle those Canadian winters, though. <laughs> All right. Anyway, can I sign up for beta testing? That's cute. 
<laughs> well, what's the issue with the AMIL in terms of it's not picking up your selection words or? Oh, the... it is. It is. But Alice out of the box is nothing close to what you, anyone would really need for a robot. Oh. You probably know that. Well, the thing that bugged me is it's just so passive. If you don't give it like a direct question, it just sits there. So I kind of want to uh, uh, mix of, uh, hey, it's, you know, it sees you, it starts, you know, at least say hi, come on. Yeah, you know, I'm <laughs> trying to use, uh, you, say uh, hi. I'm trying to use eye contact for a, uh, so when it sees two eyes, a face, basically, a face recognition, when it sees a face, it, it, sa it says somebody's talking to her, so she should listen. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to bring this up as quickly as possible. I I'm I've got a whole set of uh, articles, and they'll be online too on, on my uh, YouTube channel. Uh, I'm building this thing. It's um, you know, physically, it's probably uh, you know 50 percent done. Uh, Software-wise, it's probably 10 percent done. Yeah, and. I, I, you know, you, you, you think of something and you think of how you want to do it and you go for the best, you know, I, I don't want to build servos from scratch. I don't have that much time after work. My, my day job wouldn't allow me. Uh, so I try to get off the shelf solutions whenever I can. And so the solutions I found at the time were not adequate. So now I keep updating and updating and trying to get this thing to do everything that I wanted to do. Um, what really inspired me was Hansen. Everybody knows a Sophia. Well, well th this is, this is a, a Sophia wannabe. This is, you know, the discount Sophia. You could build this yourself. Anybody can build this for about, I don't know, under $2,000, let's say, start to finish. Assuming, you, you know, you get everything off the shelf like I did. Um, you could probably build it for a lot, whole lot less if you did a lot of your own 3D printing, but I haven't done much 3D printing out for this at all. It's mostly been... Uh, using what I had, starting with a mannequin torso and working over the top, and I will never do that again. Now that's It's too hard working within the confines of a humanoid body. It, it just, you know, everything's, you know, rounded and, 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 uh, and pinched. And where are you going to put the motor? Where are you going to put the, the, uh, the brackets? Where are you going to run the wires? Oh, it's, it's plastic. It, it doesn't hold glue. You got to hot glue it or super glue everything. It's, you, know, you just learn... What not to do when you take on a project like this. Uh, that's about it. Any questions before I end? All right, then. Thank you. All right. Was that entertaining, Camp? That's it, man. That's awesome. That was entertaining. I'm, we were, I'm entertained, okay? That, that's very cool. <laughs> I got a little something, Cap. Shoot. Hey, George. Okay. Hey, yeah. I'll just show you I hadn't been completely uh, not doing anything. I got into uh, Pico, uh, Raspberry Pi Picos. And uh, this is a breadboard. And uh, I've got this thing set up. I did get it set up and drove a servo uh, using Python. Hey, and, uh, George, show me your board again. I want to get a snapshot. Uh, okay. Let's see. Uh, my camera's not all that good on this thing. Lower okay. down, I like to see your face too. <laughs> okay, that, that's good. That's good. Okay. That's a good one. All okay, right. th then I have another one here. I bought four of these things, so uh, I got to do something with them. This is another one that I set up. I've got a serial uh, LCD display to play with there. Uh, doing Using Python is almost trivial. Uh, uh, there's some little tricks you have to own, but uh, there's lots of stuff out on the web to help you along and lots of getting started things and all that. So Python's easy. What isn't easy is getting a C compiler and writing uh, programs in C. That's got to be one of the weirdest uh, uh, tool chains I've ever tried to figure out how to do. I've been at it a couple of weeks and I'm pretty close as a matter of fact, as we sit here, I've got uh, the thing going behind me here, and I'm just having trouble with make files and stuff right now. I think I've got the tool chain pretty well put together. But you talk about something 
uh, it, it's, I, I think it's comparable to the try to put something together for Ross when you get down into doing the, the stuff that Wayne does and others that where they put the tool chains together. This is about like that, I have a feeling. <laughs> anyway, have fun with it. Very fine. That's the main thing. Have fun. Yep. See uh, you, George. Okay. Good to see you. Thanks. That, that was really great. I, I actually was I asked the question if anybody had any PICO experience. So that's really great they're showing that. Um, what what's the um, like library support in terms of like Python stuff, or is that um, well, they have that, uh, there's a thing called, let's see, SDK for it. Uh, there are a good number of examples. Uh, and uh, like I said, the, the best thing to do if you start out is just stick with Python for a while. Uh, they're, they're just little tricks to it. Like, you know, you can get something to run on it almost instantly, you get the Blake thing. It's got a LED built into it. But there's a little thing that's not quite visible to you that you have these this file that is you have to download to it. Uh, you set it up to where it makes it just look like it's a flash drive. And in order to make the program run, the name of the program has to be main. So you can't just download your program to it like you could, you know, you'd think you could. No, you have to change it to main.py then it will just boot up from a battery and you can operate the program. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's obviously a very new product. And uh, like all new products, I suspect the documentation will catch up and somebody will figure out a super neat tool change. It'll work really slick for C. And uh, there's even talk about uh, the Arduino people using this uh, chip. And uh, once they get into it, you can bet the uh, Arduino version will be really easy to deal with. Hey, Amen. So, anyway, if you want to, be able to get out on the bleeding edge of things, it probably is pretty close. You're muted. Yeah, I'm gonna. I gotta take off, folks. But you folks can can, can keep talking as long as, as long as you want. You can you can talk until security comes and throws you off. That throws you out. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys. All right, gotta much, step yeah. away. See you, folks, on the main at least. Keep building them homebrewed robots. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Cam. We had fun. Bye, bye, Cam. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, anybody else have anything to share? I think so. See you next time.